And hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Typical Skeptic Podcast. I have with me another uh, fascinating guest. This is his second time on my show. Um, I'm proud to welcome back David Lotherington. David Lotherington is with the House of L Online Spiritual School. Um, David uh, has a, a fascinating background. Um, I'm just going to read the bio from his website. At 28 years old, David had his first awakening. His abilities began to come in in waves as he developed more and more, and he healed himself and others when more skills and memories came forward to be remembered. David is a Melchizedek high priest, and he, he can channel the ascended masters, angels, galactics, God, or L. David has had recall of his past lives. Some notable lives are Sun Tzu, Marcus Aurelius, Robert the Bruce, Achilles, Sigurd Slayer of Fatnir, Lancelot Duloc, Little John, the Arknen, King David, and Enlil. All of his experiences combined assisted David in helping those who are lost and are looking for a way back for those looking to enhance themselves. He's a proficient psychic surgeon, channeler, Akashic Records reader, and teacher who hopes to share his knowledge with as many people as possible and heal those who need healing. After a second awakening, he discovered his true name, Ashar Antar, and that's what he has a YouTube page. You can check it out. It's uh, it's it's Ashar Antar on YouTube, but then he also has two websites. He has www.davidlotherington.com. That's L-O-T-H-E-R-I-N-G-T-O-N.com. And then he also has the House of L. That's T-O-T-H-O-E-L dot C-A. So that again, that's T H O E L dot C A, the house of L. And uh, with all that said, I'd like to give David a big warm welcome back to the show. David, thank you for coming back on. How are you? Hey, Rob, thanks so much. Yeah, this is going to be um, awesome. Going well, um, really. um, so what, 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 so you, you kind of embraced your new, um, uh, self. It's, it's Ashar Antar, like, what, what so Ashtar you- Anar. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, Ashtar and Art. Like, what made you come to this conclusion? Well, I had had several, several awakenings in my life. And each awakening, essentially, a little bit more of your soul comes into your body, meaning your awareness goes up, your consciousness goes up, and you gain access to more psychic abilities, essentially. Uh, for me, it was um, an understanding because of the understanding of what the name actually means. So Ashtar means holder of light and Anar means bringer of light. And for me, that translates to information. So like in the house of El, I, my job is essentially to mine information from the gods, from the ascended masters, from angels. And I channel that information and share it with people. So. Yeah. And, and you, and people are seeming to like your school. Like you, you are, so you're, are, so let me, are you asking, are you, I mean, I'm sorry, are you awakening people? Are you helping people awaken to their psychic abilities as well? So, yes, I do that as well. Yeah. That's, I, I feel like the time we're in right now, I don't know if you would agree with this or not, but I feel like it's the most exciting time to be alive. Like, because um, I know for myself personally, I've had, um, you know, just, from meditation and podcasting and trying to, you know, be more grounded and spiritual. Like I've come into a lot more of my psychic abilities. Like I, uh, I was even having a point where my pineal gland would tingle and then my crown would tingle. And I wasn't sure what that was. Um, and then, um, and then it, it, it comes and goes now, but then I was also seeing like the angel numbers, um, you know, every time I looked at the clock, it would be like one, one, one or two, two, two or three, three, three. And I, at first I didn't really believe in that stuff, but then I started like interviewing other people. And like, I, I started like other people were telling me the same things that they were kind of going through an awakening and their psychic abilities were turning on and, 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 um, and they were being, people were being able to heal. And I mean, what do you feel like we're in a special time right now or? I think it's an amazing time to be alive because people are accepting of spirituality is the first thing. You don't get burned on the cross anymore, which yeah. is a plus, right? Yeah. Um, we're in the time of AI. We're transitioning from, you might say, petroleum to electric vehicles. We're almost into space now, you might say. So it's it's a wonderful time. Yeah. Um, one of the things that you talk about is you talk about alchemy, magic, and the rules of the matrix. I was wondering mm-hmm. if we could talk a little bit about each of those, like, sure. um, especially magic, like how I, I'm, I'm so fascinated with like magic and how it works. And like, yeah, if you could talk about that a little bit. Sure, sure. 
Um, so magic isn't deception. It's not like trickery, like on stage, you might say sleight of hand and things like that. Magic is higher dimensional energy that's pulled down to this dimension. And we store it in our root chakra and it has to build up, build up, build up. Our root chakra grounds and balances the energy because energies in higher dimensions, they can have chaotic factors in them. So we ground that energy in our root chakra and we keep building up in the root chakra and it builds up and fills up our chakras. And eventually like certain people can reach up to certain levels of their chakras and your chakras are responsible for manifesting your reality. So if you're able to charge up your chakras, you charge up your capability of manifesting something. And essentially you release all the mana from your chakras at one time with a spell or a, a, you might say a magical word, a release word. And that manifests what you want into reality. That, that's magic. That's fascinating because I've been trying to do a lot more manifestation lately and like things have been like manifesting easier for me, but I, I also put in a lot of effort too. you know, I do a lot of podcasts and I, I, I work a lot on my show. So I feel like for me is like, if I'm going to use myself as an example, I feel like the effort is there. So I think that obviously helps in as far as like manifesting too, but I also use like subliminals. I use affirmations. Um, I I've messed around with sigils, you know, uh, a little bit, but, uh, um, mostly it's like, for me, it's like subliminals and affirmations. Like how do we get to this point where we're, um, actually charging up the chakras to see better manifestations? That sounds fascinating. Well, I, this came to me several years ago. I was actually sitting in a field meditating one day and I just started to have the understanding that I needed to gather the energy around me and harness that. And I didn't know why, but I was guided to do that. And it eventually evolved over several months of time, my understanding of what magic was. I never had a teacher to teach me what it was. So um, I, I learned from scratch essentially how to do it by my guy. I, it ended up being my guides who taught me how to do it. And then once they, we kind of did it enough times, it started to um, become something more than just like an idea from your guides. I was like, Oh, like this has a lot of rules. There's a lot of release words. There's a lot of things that can go wrong potentially as well. And I mean, regarding your manifestation, that's really great. And, and magic can potentially be dangerous because manifestation is the ability to make change. The ability to make change is power. So magic equals power. And if you have the ability to make change and you use it for malevolent purpose, then that's terrible. So we have to be really careful who we teach magic to in the school. And um, the House of El Council, these are essentially a council of angels, you might say, and ascended masters. They make sure that no one that's unethical or immoral has access to this information. But yeah, as I said, regarding your ability to manifest, it's really important that you are taking control over your life and you're choosing the direction that you want to go in because the matrix wants you to manifest something, but you want something as well, right? And if the matrix wants something more than you want something, then they'll win. So you have to control where you put your energy on a regular basis towards something have a goal, have an aspiration, and start creating a plan and how to put these things together to manifest what you want to manifest. That's fascinating. So, so a lot of times you're saying like, maybe, maybe I'm just speculating, but does it seems like, like maybe a lot of times things don't maybe manifest for people because they're not ready to take on that power? Does that make Sometimes sense? people just let the world decide for them. There are a lot of people in the world are backseat drivers and they just let Whoever wants to drive them, uh, take them away to wherever they want to take them. And, and that's a problem for the collective consciousness because it's not being directed. Now, traditionally, that's the role of the government to do. Like if you're referring to galactics, they know that the government's job is to guide the collective consciousness of that species in a direction that serves the highest and greatest good of that species. But humans government doesn't know about any of this stuff is a problem. And they just go towards making the most money. 
Yeah, and they they, they don't they don't want to they don't want to give any kind of benevolent wisdom or anything. You know, it seems like they just want to control. You know, right. So that's actually one of the things that the school is going to be working on in the future is kind of like giving advice to the people who need the advice, hopefully the government and, you know, people of power that can actually make change in this world. But if you get enough people together, they can make change. What what do you mean by that? Like, well, one person trying to do a single task is a difficult feat. I mean, things are not made in stone most things but once they're established it's difficult to move systems of power and structure and government and whatnot but if you have a large group of people let's say you have a million people you get a movement what they call a movement going and then that can make change so a lot of souls together can have a collectively more powerful ability to make change yeah, you know, um, I uh, I, know, I remember I was always a big fan of like the Art Bell show back in the day, and he was doing experiments with um, um, mass consciousness, where he would um, have like because he had a huge audience, right? And he would have his viewers like um, focus on something. Like like what what he would do is like he would have his audience focus on like um, deterring a storm. And they, they were actually like successful with it. You know what I mean? Like they actually like deterred the weather, but then he started getting a little bit, um, he started getting a little bit like freaked out about it because he felt like he didn't have full control over it because he felt like, what if he deterred the storm? Then it went back, you know, say it was a hurricane and it went back out to the ocean, but then it went and it hit somewhere else. He said he would have felt horrible. So he stopped doing the mass consciousness experiments. Like, but um, I, I don't know, but like, do you, so do you believe like um, when, when people do like a mass consciousness experiment like that, though, that if it's intention, if it's well intended, it can succeed? I think they, they prove that in a way during World Peace Day, there was a significant crime decrease for the next period of time after that. So I think it is possible. Um, we need to do more experiments in this regard. Yeah, I agree. Um, what about alchemy? Um, from what I, I mean, people say, like uh, they say it's like the, the turning of lead to gold, but then also it's supposed to be like the transmutation of consciousness. Do you kind of feel the same way? Yeah. Well, well regarding lead to gold, we're not quite there yet with the school. <laughs> like we've learned some basics of alchemy, but transmutation comes in many different forms and lead to gold might be one of them, but it's typically the transmutation of the soul that's essentially ascension growing from what you were maybe as more of a sheep of a person into someone who's more like a lion of a person and transmuting your fears into courage, transmuting all the negative emotions that you feel to positive emotions and change your outlook on life as well. But alchemy is a quantum thing. It's a quantum quantum science. So that means that it's complicated in the, in the school we call something that's quantum and complicated quack so alchemy is quack and um so to give you some basics we have um there's there's four pillars to alchemy there's coding balancing unification and um i'm having a brain fart and anyway so essentially they are four Everything in this world is made of material of a matrix, this holographic reality, right? But that means that there's programs in the matrix and everything has its own purpose and codes behind the veil, you might say. Stuff that we can't see, stuff that's invisible. But if you get into programming, coding, balancing, and unification, that's the fourth one, you can tap into the code of the hologram. So programming is essentially the function of the thing. Coding is the details within the function. Um, And they all have to do with changing the internal natural ability of something. So it's not something that everybody should know about because trees, they always grow. They represent certain things in life like... uh, perpetual growth and vitality and beauty and things like that. But you can change the properties of something like that. So, yeah. 
What, what do you like? How how do you change the properties of it? Like what like what, like what, you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, I know what you're saying. We we haven't really gotten there yet. We're we're still learning initiate level knowledge regarding alchemy. But if you want to imagine Snow White, uh, the movie Snow White, yeah, not the new one, um, the old cartoon where the old craggly witch has a poisonous apple. She essentially, I think she dipped it in poison, but you could have a poisonous apple if you corrupted the programming of a tree. So a tree will naturally produce healthy fruits, but if you change the programming of it, uh, it's possible that it could start producing something that's actually bad for you if you change the program of the tree. That's cool. So you can kind of change the DNA of something almost, right? Like, Yeah, it's essentially tampering with, well, DNA is what creates the holographic reality. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so oh, so DNA is like the blueprint behind the, the holographic reality kind of. Is that kind of what you're yeah. saying? Yes. Yeah. That I was just looking up a book while we were talking. I wanted to tell you about this book. I don't know if you ever heard of it. It's um, it's called The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho. Have you ever heard of it? I haven't. It's All the alchemy knowledge that I have is actually just from channeling. So I don't really. Oh yeah, it, it's uh, it's really good. It's uh, it's it's a uh, it's a. Uh, it just says combining magic, mysticism, wisdom, and wonder in an inspiring tale of self-discovery. The Alchemist has become a modern classic, selling millions of copies around the world and transforming the lives of countless readers. It's it's about a, a mystical story of Santiago, an Andalusian shepherd boy who learns who yearns to travel in search of worldly travel. His quest will lead him to riches for far different and far more satisfying. It's like basically about the it's it's like like learning the essential win wisdom and listening to our hearts and it's I, I thought you might like it it's it's a it's a really good book it's uh you know I I I, I had to refresh myself on it because like I, I I had heard from it from uh, Gerald Clark I was a big fan of Gerald Clark's and then you know um I, I read it and it, it you know it was uh it was interesting but I'll, I'll move on but but so with the, when we talk about the DNA and the the blueprint of the matrix you said and another podcast that there are like rules to the matrix. Like what are the, yeah. we, from what we know, like what are the rules of this matrix? And then how does that tie into what we're able to do with our lives or manifest? Well, I've been channeling two days a week for about three years now. And wow. I would say every third class is about the rules of the matrix. So there are so many rules. It's so profound that we're still learning new rules even today, but essentially um, there are universal laws. And if you understand the universal laws, you can have an idea of how things work essentially. So I discovered one of them called, uh, if you build it, I call it from based off of the field of dreams kind of movie. But essentially if you create a space, something that's made to fill that space will fill it. It's the universal law. Now, let's say you have a dirty house. It's not bad to have a dirty house for one day, but if you have a dirty house for a month or two months, it's going to attract things that love a dirty space, like cockroaches or mice or rats, right? Now, these cockroaches, mice, and rats, they're not bad beings, but they love a low-frequency environment. They love like bad feng shui, you might say. They love dirtiness and filth so if you build a baseball field then eventually baseball players and fans of baseball will be attracted to that if you build a hospital it's going to attract doctors and nurses and sick people so but your body is the same way so your soul its frequency goes up and it goes down if you are happy then you're going to attract good things into your life but if you're sad Let's say you're sad for one day, nothing bad happens. But if you're sad for a month, then you might attract an entity that's attracted to that same frequency as you. And that's how people get attachments, energetic attachments. So I I was wondering if I had something like that, because uh, I uh, what I was going to say is like, it's weird. Like I'm like 40. I just turned 44. And uh, I, I, I haven't been able to have a completely successful relation. I'm not, I'll rephrase that one. I've had a lot of girlfriends and I've had a lot of long-term relationships, but, you know, I haven't like 
met the girl. I mean, I thought I met the girl in my dreams. So, but you know, it, it never seems to work out. So I almost feel like I'm repeating, like, and I'm, I'm starting to learn this about myself that I'm repeating like the same pattern over and over again, which is leading to, um, uh, you know, unsuccessful relationships. You know what I mean? I don't think it's just the girl or, or the women, that, the women that were in my life or on this case, multiple, you know what I mean? And, um, you know, a lot actually, but I mean, like, so it, it has, it has to be something with me too. So, do we have to like take it upon ourselves to like make significant change? So the next time we get into something like that, it doesn't tend to repeat itself. Is that a matrix law? If you, Yes, it is. That's one of the matrix rules. If you don't make a change, you don't pass that level of the video game, then it it's you're doomed to have to repeat it again. Just like in Mario Brothers, if you die in the game, you have to repeat the level, right? And in our life, it's not just, you don't have to die to have to repeat the level, but we have, we're faced with challenges and the, the challenges take different forms because it manifests in a quantum way. And if we're not able to see the lesson and have the awareness that, oh shit, this is the same test that I had last time, but this time I'm going to buy my girlfriend flowers or buy her chocolate on her birthday or whatever it might be. Um, you have to find out what you did wrong in the last relationship to be able to change it for your next one. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, it's, it's interesting. Uh, like relationships are, are really interesting to me. Like I never understood, like, I feel like this is a matrix rule too. I feel like every time I meet a new woman, like um, if I start to like them a lot, it makes them draw away. But if I draw away from the relationship, it makes them like me more. And, and that's just something like, and, and I've always thought to myself, well, why does that happen? Like, mm -hmm. you know, is this like a matrix rule? Is this like, is this like a, is this a, 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 a or not a rule, but is this like something that like you, you find like um, happen with everybody? Yeah, I think so. I don't know if it's a rule or not. It's, it could be, but when you chase something, it runs from you. Right. And, and they say that about money, too. That's so interesting. They say when you chase money, it runs. When you chase opportunity, it comes. That's mm. the saying, you know. But I think, yeah. And when you run from the women, they come. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. You don't give them attention. They come. They're like cats, you might say. I hope I don't get in trouble for that. But <laughs> a cat is like if you try to touch a cat too much, they just leave. Right. But if you're just chilling the cat will like jump on your arm and <laughs> cuddle with you. I know it's strange. It's really, it's really bizarre, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to get into, uh, so you've been channeling for um, three, three, every, every day, or you said two times a week for three years now, like what all have yeah. you learned since that time? Oh, I have so many questions about channeling. Like, like, how do you, how do you prepare yourself for this? And how did you open yourself up for this? And like, um, and when did you know, like that, what, when it was like, it was right to start doing this? Like, sorry, mm -hmm. that's a lot of questions, but like, they're all good questions. Rest, though. Though. They're all good questions. Honestly, I had no idea that I was going to be a channeler. I had no idea I was going to be an energy healer. I had no idea I'd be a telepath or talking with galactics or channeling the gods, you might say, but the universe wanted me to do this and it guided me into this path. And honestly, I started out as a Reiki practitioner and I got better and better as I leveled up in my Reiki, became a master. And then I started to see people's fields. And then I started to be able to talk to my clients' guides. And then they used to tell me like what they can fix or help in their life and what to do with their life. Then I started seeing auras and talking to galactics and things like that. So it unveiled when I was on my proper life path, you might say. So because I did what made me happy, I never felt like I was working and I was enjoying the process. I never put too much pressure on myself to grow, to open my third eye or, but I did put a lot of pressure on myself to heal energetically. Uh, yeah. And every time I healed myself, my abilities got a little bit stronger. So for anyone who wants to open up their psychic abilities further, um, I would recommend doing some healing on yourself, energetic healing. Yeah, I've always wondered if a lot of um, physical problems come from energetic ones. And I'll just like, I'll explain to you why I think this is the way it is. I can't remember if we talked about this 
um, last time. I don't think this was happening the last time you were on my show, but uh, what happened was, is I uh, I went through like a breakup, you know, and I think this all stems up from stems from the breakup because what happened was, um, you know, I thought it was like a twin flame or like a divine union or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I, I've talked about this on many of my past shows. So if my audience is hearing this again, or when they do hear this, I hope they don't get angry. I just have to like get different people's opinions on it, you know? So sure. um, I do remember so, that actually. Yeah. So like, so, so then like three months afterwards, like this pain in my liver started showing up. Like it was like, and then I didn't want to go through mainstream medical because I don't really believe in mainstream medical, but I did. So over like the last six months, I've went through mainstream medical and I've had um, CT scans done and I, they put the camera over my organs. And, you know, um, the only thing they said that they could find is that maybe I had a little bit of a fatty liver or whatever, like um mm -hmm. that all my blood work always came back fine you know what i mean so mm -hmm. um so uh, i have a lot of friends who are like you they're like energy healers and psychics and i talked to a lot of people because i do my podcast and everybody was telling me a lot of people were saying like they're like dude you have something stuck in your meridians like they they're like this is like stuck energy they're like you're probably harnessing anger in your liver from the break uh, i was just gonna say the liver is usually associated with anger do you, do you think that's what was happening though? Or does, does that sound about right? Yeah. So anger usually comes from um, frustration, trying to do the same thing over and over um, to create a change, but the change never happens. That creates frustration and, and frustration leads to anger. Yeah. And I think that's exactly what it was. Cause I was like, you know, so like resentful about like what had happened that it caused me to, uh, you know, now what's weird about lately is it, it kind of went away. Well, I've had a couple of different people heal me or what, what I, you know, I have a friend, a couple of friends, Selena and Priscilla, they, they can really like reach out and like touch people. Um, I've noticed you're a psychic surgeon too. Like, are you able to do that as well? Like you're able to like kind of reach out and touch someone in a good way. I don't typically frame it in those words, but yes, <laughs> it's, that's the best, that's the <laughs> easiest way for me to put it. Like, and I think it sounds kind of funny too, when you say it that way, but I mean, um, cause that's what I've experienced that when, when I have someone heal me, you can feel them like working on your body. So I always say, well, that person can reach out and touch someone in a good way. Cause they're not yeah. harmful. You know, it sounds like you have fairly strong clairsentience. That's clear feeling you might say. Uh, that's like hot and cool tingly sensations from spirit. Um, but yeah, regarding the energy healing, I'll usually create a proxy from my house and then I can work on the proxy, which you will feel uh, when I'm working on you, for example. So. Yeah. And you're right. I do have real, real, real um, strong, like uh, sensing. I can send like I, we, me and I just had a rock Astaldo on my show last night. He's like a mystic, you know, and we were talking about like, we both get like, I get like, real um weird uh feelings from stuff like when i touch a crystal i get a lot of energy from it like if okay. i touch a piece of velvet i make it a bad reaction to it um mm. it's weird i get like real weird reactions from like different touching things you know that's called clair tangency oh okay what, what does that mean like clair tangency means clear touch so essentially you'll touch an object and you'll be able to some people that are detectives have this ability and they would pick up the murder weapon and then they could see who was holding the weapon. They could see where the weapon came from. They could see what happened before or after that event. Yeah. Pretty strong ability. Yeah. One, one, one of the things I've always wondered about, like my own psychic abilities is like, I'm highly intuitive. Like I'm never able to like get the Powerball numbers or anything like that. And I, I don't think anybody's able to, but like what I was going to say is like, it seems like, like I'm always given like psychic warnings. Like, you know, it's never um, like, it'll be very rare that I'll get a, 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 a notification that I call them notifications because that's what it seems like to me. It, se it seems like a notification you would get on your phone or computer. It just comes in your mind instead, you mm -hmm. know, but I, every time I get a psychic notification, it's always like a warning that like something's about to happen. And usually like 80 to 90% of the time, it's right. It's not very, it's not off that much. Like, uh I wonder what that is. If that's just like our natural instincts or if that's like, you know what it's I mean? It's definitely not your instincts. It would be your guides talking to you. So when you, you mentioned earlier that you see uh, numerology or you yeah. see nu numerical sequences, that's your guides talking to you. 
And uh, I would recommend that you start looking up what you're seeing on license plates or on clocks or whatever. You can type in um, a good website is angel numbers. Just type that in and type in the number that you see. And um, that'll tell you what's what your guides are trying to portray to you. Um, a lot of people are, I mean, I kind of looked it up. I did some research and I, I found out that usually the angel sometimes or not usually they, I heard that sometimes the angel numbers can represent that your guides are trying to tell you something or that you're on the right path. And yeah. it's interesting that I only started seeing the angel numbers. And um, when I started doing my podcast full time, I've been doing my mm-hmm. podcast full time for like a year now, you know, and um and I've seen them more and more, which makes me think that maybe someone's trying to tell me that like I'm on the right path or maybe I'm, I'm, I'm doing my soul's purpose. You know, I, I think that's exactly the case. And uh, regarding your YouTube, I wouldn't be too concerned with like, I, I mean, last time I seen you, you had half the subscribers, right? Um, any good business takes like three to five years. So so a lot of people worry after the first year and they say, oh, this isn't, I don't have a million subscribers yet and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just going to give it up. But you have to keep going and keep persevering on what you care about. I and, agree. Yeah. Because you're doing a disclosure thing. And uh, a lot of people that have YouTube programs or podcasts and whatnot that are doing disclosure there, I, I don't want to say shadow ban, but sometimes that is the case. And it's not the most popular topic for the masses either so but everyone that's meant to see and hear your programs to hear it so that's important yeah i i got suspended a couple times like one time recently because uh someone said the well i can't talk about it here because i'm gonna put this on youtube but i mean um you you can probably guess what they the thing they you know they said medical misinformation Mm -hmm. so you know it's like it's wild but um, so uh, talk about being a telepath for the for the galactics and the gods. Like, how sure. did that start, and what kind of information do you get from them? Well, I'll talk about how it started. Uh, the information I get from them is like, like we literally have three years worth of material that's being archived, and I'm going to be putting that into several different books uh, from like. Like we've spoke to Odin. We learned about the nine realms from Odin. We learned new energy healing techniques from Master Jesus. We learned from alchemy from Saint Germain. We learned about the matrix from Anu. Um, We learned about magic from Merlin. And we learned about galactics from Ashtar, like the list goes on and on. We learned about the anti-life from uh, Osiris. Anyway, um, super cool. And you can join the classes as well if you want it. Like we, we do have them twice a week. So, and it's meant made for the public to be able to join. Yeah. But um, what's it like being a telepath? I mean, like it, it's pretty fun. I mean, I live a pretty solitary life. And um, whenever I'm just hanging around and not really focused on something, I'll typically tap into a telepathic bandwidth, which is like beings that are talking to each other um depends on dimensions but different beings will talk to each other in the band in the telepathic bandwidth but you can direct your telepathy of course that's just kind of like a default setting for me it but, almost sounds like it like it's like almost like internet like telepathic bandwidth is almost like internet bandwidth is that similar like it's like but it's in through the mind obviously but is it's it seems like it has like some kind of like um i don't know like simil- similarities or something you know well, it's all computer, right? That's why there's similarities because it, it's you, like me, as I guess, tapping into a certain dimension, changing my frequency, just like a radio station, just like changing the dial on a radio to tap into a particular frequency of a, to speak to a certain being. So it really depends where I want to go. But typically myself and several others, every Monday we have telepathy class. And we'll, we'll take people up to the ship of the Athena of the Ashtar command, and they'll meet sometimes it's long lost loves. Sometimes it's galactics that they're actually with on the ship because they're star seeds or ground crew. Um, sometimes it's friends and family, you know, soulmates, soul family members, 
Um, and they, they're they able to explore the ship and they're able to learn the lessons of the galactic. So what, one thing we're doing right now at the school is we're learning, our initiate level of the school is uh, learning from age two and a half to nine years old, galactics. So whatever galactics learn about from two and a half to nine years is what we're learning about in the initiate level of the school. From 10 years to approximately 15 years, that's our add-up level. And that's what galactics learn from 10 to 15 years old. And that information is gonna be very complicated, but um, we're, getting, we're getting there. And then we have master level after that, which is like 16 to 20 years old by approximation or what galactics learn from that age. Um, so, yeah. Are you, would you say you're getting like amazing confirmations from your telepathy, telepathy class? Yeah, I am. Um, I mean, the channeling is really showing now. The, the longer you do something, the better you get at it naturally. And because I've been channeling for such a long time, I've gotten better over the years. But when you start to notice less and less of your vocabulary being used and new words that you don't even know, uh, words you don't have the definitions of, um, they're starting to speak not in a way that you speak and they're using very little of your natural knowledge and more of knowledge that you have no idea about. That's when you know you're getting better and better as a psychic. Yeah. And then when it comes to channeling, who is your favorite um, entity to channel or, or, or being? Oh, or That's tough, tough question to answer. There's a lot of them and that the teachers of the school kind of rotate, but I think Ashtar, Sharon. Yeah. And like, he's a representation of what the Ashtar command. That's correct. That's awesome. Like, and like, w w do they say anything about like, um, like open extraterrestrial contact with like humans, like, or is it, are they going to continue to do it? Like, um, okay. So for example, like the way like society is kind of set up now, as far as like human interaction with extraterrestrials is, you know, people go to sleep at night and they usually either get taken or they have some kind of mystical experience with an extraterrestrial or, you know, some people have experiences in the astral or, you know, um, some people get abducted in the daytime or some people have um, daytime, you know, experiences with ETs. But the point I'm trying to make is it's more of like a one on one type experience where the ETs or the interdimensionals, whatever you want to call them, are reaching out to humans on a one on one basis, maybe because they don't trust the governments of the world. Um, do you see that keeping to be a thing or do you think there will eventually be like open contact with like extraterrestrial civilizations or interdimensional, whatever you want to? Yeah, man. I think that um, humans still need some work. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's becoming more and more relevant as I learn more about the teachings of children galactics. Like these are literally kids under the age of nine, but they're learning things that human adults can't comprehend. And they definitely can't, uh, I mean, maybe with some training, they can actually apply these practices to their life but it can be a challenge to absorb all that information, just the sheer mass of the information. Um, when it comes to galactics interactions with one-on-one, -on -one, it, it's usually because you're in a certain soul family or you have a certain bloodline that they're, they've been following for a while, or you're a star seed. And if you're a star seed, then you might be a crew member for um, perhaps the Galactic Federation Light or another federation. So that's why it's one on one. They don't want to talk to a bunch of, um, well, it comes down to the matrix essentially. So yeah, uh, I I noticed that you you communicate with a a Mister Smith or an Agent Smith like like you have in the matrix. Like, is that kind of like is there a real entity in this matrix like like that? Is that like yes? That's called we call it the Smith in the school. The Smith essentially ensures that if anything too crazy happens, it's blipped back to what it's supposed to be what its default template is supposed to be so when we're learning about magic in the school and that's the ability to make change with manifestation if we manifest something that's too crazy too out of order with what the matrix is supposed to be then the smith we say the smith will get you but it's more like the smith um, will restore the matrix back to its natural order. 
So it's an artificial intelligence system. Yeah. And I, I, I sometimes wonder if there's a, like a malevolent aspect to it because um, I, I always feel this and I've, I've had other people kind of confirm this feeling that they, that they had, this happens to them sometimes too. Like um, sometimes like, like what'll happen is like, if I announce something to someone, like if I tell someone, if I'm feeling really good about something and I say, Oh, like, or, or here's an example. I'll say like, if, if I, like tomorrow I'm supposed to have, so-and-so this guest on and this guest on and this guest on and i'm having three people and i'm really excited about it i can't believe it next thing you know like i would wake up the next morning and like either two out of three of those would cancel or it'll reschedule or like so, so it always seems like when if i have something really good going in my life like the matrix the matrix finds a way excuse my language to fuck it up <laughs> like, and I feel like that's like a matrix component doing that because I can't explain it any other way. And it's happened time after time. I don't know if this could be like some kind of like default um, sub uh, programming in me that's doing this, like where I'm like subconsciously not knowingly putting out like a, like a negative reality that's affecting this, but I don't think so. I don't know. You know, I, I think you could be right because, um, well, there's an old expression that goes, you never tell the devil that you're going to leave him. But um, so this sort of applies to that. But uh, I would say the matrix, if you trust, trust that everything's going to work out perfectly for you, you'll be wrong. And the matrix, sorry for some people, they're like, oh my God, no. But the matrix makes it so that you have to force your will into something that you want to create. If you don't use your will, then the matrix will use your will for you to create what they want to manifest. And the matrix is designed to control, to um, disempower you and to remove your ability to live essentially in this world. What, uh, why though? Why is there, is it a malevolent system? I don't believe it's malevolent, but it's programmed against you. I would say for sure but it's to strengthen you. So the matrix, I was told it's created by Tiamat and Anu and the Smith. These are the creators of it. Anu is the Anunnaki and Tiamat is the primordial goddess of chaos, you might say, one of them, Creatrix. Um, now they created the matrix to strengthen the individuals in it and but if you're not strong enough to face your accusers, if you're not strong enough to say, no, I'm moving forward with this, then the matrix will deny you what you want. So you really have to be strong. And, and because these beings are on it, one's Anunnaki and one's uh, a Hydra, a dragon, then it's draconic in its nature. And dragons believe in strength and honor. They believe that you have to be strong to survive. And I believe that's reflected in the creation of the matrix itself. Yeah, that 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 word, that word Tiamat that goes back to the Enuma Elish. You know, yes. I know they talk about Tiamat and the Enuma Elish. Mm -hmm. I can't remember exactly what they they say. It's uh, it, I know they talk about a planet splitting off, and I wonder if that was like when the matrix was created. You know? Yes, it has to do with uh, Marduk and Tiamat. A lot of it. Yeah, that's interesting. It really is. Um, one thing I heard you say that was interesting when you uh, interviewed with uh, James Brink was um, you were talking about like how Enlil and Enki are kind of representations of Archangel Michael and Lucifer. If you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, every time I talk about Enki, I always get flack from, I can't remember the name of the lady, but there's essentially a lady that uh, represents Enki. And she has a lot of followers. They're very zealous or over protective of the information that she preaches. Um, but anyway, yes. So what I was told from the Anunnaki is that there was this world called Anu Alom. This was essentially the Anunnaki and land when they lived on earth. They don't look like men with beards. That's a holographic projection to hide what their actual form looks like but anyway humans can't tell the difference in these things most what, what do they really look like i'd love to know um well i've seen it it depends what dimension they're from i've seen six dimensional anunnaki and, and i've seen seventh dimensional anunnaki and they both look different 
Um, so the sixth dimension that the being I seen was Freya. Um, she had, she was eight feet tall, 250 pounds. Uh, so she was quite slender. Um, she had two massive wings. They had a 16 foot wingspan. She had, you know, four fingers, one thumb on each hand. She had four toes, one, one big toe, I guess, or five toes. Um, she had horns on her head, three horns. And they have this um, loose skin on the back. So the back, <laughs> I hope I don't get, I would never kill myself, okay? <laughs> yeah, if this gets flagged by the government or whatever. Um, they have this like loose skin on the back and um, right on the spine. And that engorges with blood when they're in the sun and um, causes them to be very sexually stimulated, you might say. They, uh, they have like a small, tiny tail. It's only very, maybe two or three inches. The one Freya had that. And they have cloaca as well. So that's like um, poo and pee in one hole, you might say. Oh my gosh. That's so, so that's weird. a six dimensional one. Yeah. But so are any of them like human like, or is that like you said, that's just a holographic or are any of them reptilian or is that like, Oh, that was very reptilian. Yep. She yeah. had scales. Oh, wow. That's strange. That, yeah, so, yeah. so they're definitely like a reptilian race. You would say they're hundred percent reptilian. Wow. And yeah. They're not half ripped. Some people say they're half rep. What do they say? Like half Pleiadian and half reptilian, but they're, they're all reptilian. They're dragons technically. Wow. That's yeah. interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. So, but where I was going with that was we were saying that like Enki and Enlo are kind of representations of Archangel Michael and Lucifer. Now, does that mean that Archangel Michael and Lucifer aren't, uh, at their individual entities or are they? So I don't know a lot about Lucifer. I just know that they're a reflection of Michael, Archangel Michael. Um, angels are all part of one being they're all god you might say and they're extensions of god's personality um yeah like i don't know a lot about lucifer but i know that enlil is a reflection of archangel michael and ashtar is a reflection of archangel michael as well so there is a, a triad there archangel michael enlil and ashtar sharon and then there's Another one over here, uh, I'm just getting some information. I believe it's Enki, Lucifer, and Hades. I believe that's the second triad. Um, but yeah, essentially back in the day, back in Anu alone, this was the kingdom of Enki and Enlil owned by Anu. And Anu gave reigns to Enlil and Enki, and together they ruled over this beautiful, harmonious place. But one day there was a coup and what I was told from the story that Enlil was struck on the head with a, a rock. But what actually happened is they, they lost their connection to the divine that was broken when they were struck on the head, this metaphor. And what happened was Enlil started to wander lost and they wandered into the woods because every time someone that knew them said their name they didn't recognize them they had amnesia from the attack uh, so they forgot that they were prince they forgot their duties they forgot their friends and their family and they wandered off into the woods and what happened was enki took the the throne because enlil couldn't take care of their duties and they became all powerful and the owner of earth essentially um, but during the struggle during the transition of enlil leaving and enki taking the throne there was a, a large clash of power and there was a struggle for power. And that's essentially a reflection of why this earth is so crazy right now is what I was told. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, I, I was going to say, uh, where, where was I going with that? Oh, um, so uh, well, oh, let me try to think. I, I, know, I, know, I hate when that happens. I had a brain um, you know, when, when you totally forget about like, it just like, just goes out of my mind. Like, uh, okay, I had space arcs written down. So do, do you think that the space arcs are activating around the world? And does that mean that the giants would activate with them? Do we know anything about that? So I, I channeled some information on the arcs before. Apparently there's three arcs. 
and uh, there's been vibrations around where they're located, but that's just them running their maintenance drives is what I was told. Um, but they are massive ships and the, their arc ships, meaning they will only launch when the world is about to be destroyed. Essentially, they will not launch before that because once they leave the, once they start to leave the atmosphere, they're going to f- screw everything up. Excuse my French. Yeah. They're going to um, cause well, massive devastation on the planet when they do leave. That makes me think about Nibiru. Do you believe Nibiru is a um, a real planet? Is that where the Anunnaki are from? And like, um, what's up with that? Not all of them, I don't think. But um, a lot of them. Depends what Anunnaki you talk to. Um, Cam, I talked to this young lang named Cam. He's quite young, less than 15, I'd say. In, in Anunnaki in years. <clears throat> but compared like one Anunnaki in years, like 10,000 human years, you might say. So he's quite old, but wow. he still acts like a youngling. And um, I'm trying to talk to him about making something of value with his life because he stops in and talks to me on occasion. And I tell him that he's a bum, which he hates. And I'm like, you don't, you don't provide any value. You just hang around and just watch television with me. What are you doing? Like, why don't you go make, do something good with your life, learn how to do energy healing or something like that. But anyway, (laughs) do you, I was going to say, I was going to, this might be a little bit of a basic question for you, but do you ever have any, um, uh, like weird, weird encounters with spirits or ghosts? Well, I mean, that's kind of my job. Yeah. Like, like, so, so it's like, it's like a norm. So you, you communicate with the spirit world on a regular basis is what you're saying. Yeah, that's very true. I, I do my best. Like I don't do house clearings anymore, but I used to do house clearings for people. Um, I bought a house. (laughs) I didn't know it was haunted, but I, I had to clear this before I knew anything about spirituality. That was pretty interesting experience. How Um, bad was it? It was, it was just one deceased woman. So I'll tell you the story if you want to hear it. Yeah, sure. It'd be awesome. I uh, I bought this house really cheap and uh, I, I've since sold it, but after it's cleared. Um, and I used to be able to, I was doing renovations on the house to fix it up. And then I was going to rent it out to students. And um, I used to go in there with my dog. But during the nighttime, my dog would not be in the building. Like my dog would try to scratch at the door and try to get out. And I couldn't understand why. So whenever I tried to do renovations on the building at nighttime, my dog, I couldn't pull my dog into the building. Um, But anyway, I was doing some flooring and every time I was like, I had my head deep in the closet, I felt like someone was trying to push me over. And when I was working and painting the walls, going down the stairs, it felt like someone was trying to push me down the stairs as well. It made me quite uncomfortable. And, um, so I was like, what the hell is this? Is my house haunted? And I came to the conclusion one day when I see, I was standing in the kitchen and I, the house has two staircases. Um, there's a maid staircase and just like a regular staircase, I guess. And I seen this white apparition or ghost, whatever you want to call it, like fly down the stairs and rush at me. And, um, I like, I was like, fuck excuse me, screw this. And I left the house that night. But over the next couple of days, I built up the courage to, um, I was like, all right, forget, this is my house, not her house. So I I went into the house and I sat down on the floor and I asked the spirit to come and show themselves to me. And then uh, I asked for Archangel Michael to come and to help her to transition into, you know, wherever. Um, So I was talking to the spirit and she said, I have to do one thing before I leave. And she, I could see her flying, like flying down the staircase and she flew into the basement and um, down in the basement, it's like a mud basement, but there's a warm morning down there. And a warm morning is essentially like a coal slash wood burning cast iron kind of like whatever wood stove. And she was stoking the fire down there, even though it wasn't even attached to any pipes or anything. And then she went up in the kitchen and I could see this all psychically when my eyes were closed. And then she did something 
on the stove and then she came back up to us and then she transitioned with michael so that Mideki brings up a lot of good points like what is uh what do you think is happening when spirits get trapped here why are they getting trapped here and then why are they doing these uh i mean because you're not the only one who's talked about this like why are they doing these like redundant chores like that like they would do on their regular lives like do they not realize that they're dead or like um do they feel like they've left something behind or um I mean, I guess there's a lot of reasons, right? But I mean, yeah, yeah. that's 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 a, it's so interesting though, right? Because like ghosts are very prevalent everywhere. You know, I had a spirit in here in my podcast studio. I it's still here. When nope. I fall asleep, I was falling asleep on this couch the other night behind me, and my arm was falling off the side, and something grabbed my arm and like shook my hand and like brought it back up. Because but what what was the interesting part was if my arm would have continued to go the way it would have what was going, like I was like falling asleep. And and like, I wouldn't have realized it. Like my arm would have gotten like injured. Like I would have had a pulled shoulder. I wouldn't have broke, but I probably would have had a pulled shoulder for a couple of days. Cause like, I was like, I took an edible that night. So, you know, I was probably like, you know, like probably like a little bit high. So I was like, just like dozing off. But then, and then um, I also, what's interesting is like this spirit is like done like, um, I, I called it, I saw to this another podcast, I called it a paranormal shiatsu because this, this spirit, like I'll, I'll lay down on the couch at night and this spirit like starts to massage me. It's, it's hilarious. But then, huh. but then I started waking up with like bruises on me and I, I was, but then, you know, I, I didn't want to blame that on the spirit. Cause I was like, well, that could be from like some kind of like a abduction experience that I'm not maybe getting memories of. I don't, I, I don't, I don't feel like the spirits intentions are malevolent at this point. I don't know, but I, I don't, it doesn't, it doesn't, it, and it's never showed itself to me. You know what I mean? So you I should, don't think it's like, I don't know. You could, um, I would recommend you did something similar to what I did. Uh, it doesn't sound like it's too malevolent, but the bruises aren't good. Um, so they might, be like tapping into your field and using your hands um, which is like a subtle possession which is not great yeah so i'd recommend that you ask uh, an angel for help to uh, help them to transition and they will help and they can remove the spirit for you you don't really need that much knowledge in the anti-life but typically spirits ghosts poltergeists they are processing their karma in the anti-life and they're forced to repeat the lessons that they've learned and the karmas that they put on others in the anti-life. So they kind of get stuck. So spirits are below the third dimension or ghosts are below the third dimension. I should reframe, not, not spirit. Um, people use the word spirit a bit too much, but uh, yeah. And um, so because they're below our dimension, that means they, they're less complex than us. So their, their emotional spectrum is not as complex as us. And they don't typically have the same empathy as we have. And um, they tend to repeat things over and over again. So they kind of get lost. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. I, I never, I, like when I had my, I mean, like I always used to listen to Art Bell when I was young, but then I had my awakening in like 2016 and like, I don't ever think I could ever go back to living a normal life, knowing what I know now. You know what I mean? I just couldn't be like, I would never be content. Like um, I would, I can never be content, like just watching sports and um, going to work and, um, and, uh, and, and letting something else steer my life. You know, I think that's what going back to the beginning of our conversation, maybe this is a good segue to like finish up is like, you know, like I, I don't feel comfortable letting someone else steer my life. Like I want to be the person in charge of my manifestations and, mm -hmm. um, and, and you know what I mean? If that makes any sense, like that's that like, sense. and I've kind of tried to take control of it, you know, but I like talking to people like yourself because you seem to like have all the, you know, you, you seem to be able to know how to manifest really well. And like, you, you, you know, what's going on with this stuff a lot, you know? I still have a long way to go personally, but, um, we're getting there. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. It's, uh, but, uh, well, do you want to tell everybody how they can uh, sign up for the school, come to your telepathy class and anything else you want to promote? And, uh, thank you so much for doing this. This was amazing. Sure. It was fun, Rob. I appreciate it. Um, thanks for having me on again. Um, so if you want to join the house of L, we have a one month 
um, promotion where essentially you can join us for free for one month. You can join our Wednesday and Sunday classes. Um, but if you want to join telepathy, um, you want to do psionics class, we do that on Tuesdays and all the other stuff that we do, like join our Slack and become part of the community, then you'll have to go through the mentorship program. So check out our my website at thoel.ca for that. Um, if you type in my name, David Lotherington on Facebook, you should be able to find me there. And that's our temporary The House of L page. And we also have an Instagram at um, The House of L. Type in The House of L Mystery School and you should find it. And if you want to find us on YouTube, we have type in The House of L Mystery School on YouTube and we'll pop up. And Cernick is uh, our primary teacher for um, the YouTube. So he's creating the YouTube channel for us. So that's what you're going to see. And then you also have a page under um, your um, channel name, right? Ashtar, I forget how to pronounce it. Yeah, Ashtar Nar. So I don't typically use my the website with my name, davidlotherington.com. I don't use that anymore. I'm trying to use the house of L.ca only. Um, but yeah, I go by Ashtar Nar on the website. That's cool. Well, uh, thank you so much, David. And uh, I'd love to do it again. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll send you a link when I put this out. Sure. Sounds great, Rob. I appreciate it. Have All a right, wonderful take day. Take care. Thanks. Have a thank good you. night.